Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to the New Books Network. Today we have Robin Goldstein and Daniel Sumner of UC Davis and authors of Can Legal Weed Win? The Blunt Realities of Cannabis Economics. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks, John. Nice to be here. I want to make it clear up front to listeners that this is not Bill and Ted's excellent adventure into weed economics. You are both PhD economists and work in agriculture, uh, one of you with a, um, an extra Ivy League law degree for good measure. But uh, tell me, uh, each of you, about your very interesting paths that led you to writing this book. Dan, if you want to go first. Sure. So so I'm a longtime agricultural economist. I got the cannabis uh, as a part of the economics of food and agriculture and beverages and the like. I've worked in wine economics. When I taught in North Carolina, I did a lot of tobacco economics. That makes sense. So for me, getting to weed as it became a major issue uh, here in California was natural. And it actually started, Robin uh, knew some people, and we were asked by the, De- the Bureau of Cannabis Control here in California whether we would help them think about regulations. And my first response was, no, no, that was a long time ago. I don't do drugs anymore. And fortunately, the, the cannabis czar of California, Lori Ajax, I also said, why don't you get some consulting firm? They can do something for you. You just need a report to go on a shelf. And she said, we actually want to use economics to help do what we can to improve regulations. Uh, she had me in one, <laughs> you know, so, so that, that suckered me in. And it's been a very interesting six, seven years doing cannabis economics since then. I, on the other hand, uh, came to this through uh, originally through food, wine, and beer. So my, but especially wine and beer. My my work had been on wine economics. That's what first brought me to UC Davis. There's a lot of wine, cool wine stuff and beer stuff going on there. Um, so I was working with Dan on on that for several years. And then when when the uh, cannabis uh, work came in, it it brought together I think a long standing interest. There's a there's a, a lot of uh, similarities between the beer and wine markets and cannabis but uh but i'd also been interested kind of from a from the perspective of of social justice for many years about the cannabis industry and and legalization so yeah all right and at uc davis there's a natural and historical focus on agriculture given its region in the country and in the in the state so economics and agriculture are the common themes and weed is an agricultural product Um, but first let's get into one uh little historical political tidbit that I found interesting. The stories that you opened in the introduction with Tom Daschle and and John Bonner getting involved early in the industry. The first one doesn't shock me. The second does. How does a conservative Republican get involved in the weed business? Was he a a closet hippie all along and I just didn't know it? I I think that one's simple. Uh, He he was a, a closet lobbyist all along. Like a lot of congressmen are, and I actually uh, interacted with Dashiell quite a bit uh, earlier in my career when I was doing agricultural policy broadly. Very conservative man, uh, uh, so so it surprised me just because he really was a very conservative person. Uh, I mean, that's he, South Dakota for gosh sakes. So, uh, and and he got to food and agriculture really through in a very natural South Dakota sort of way, partly to help food for the poor. So, so there was that social justice part to, to somebody like Dashiell, but when it came to farm kinds of things, he was very much of a conservative, but, but uh, it does show that uh, cannabis business has become, you know, it's not hippies. It's, it's, it's business people that are interested in an indus in an emerging industry, I would say, uh, and some of the uh, sort of old hippie taint that, uh, you know, my generation's cannabis uh, back when I was in a, a college kid or, or, or a young graduate student, uh, those, uh, those days are really long gone for most of the industry. And Oklahoma is a very red state, but they, they score very well on the economic front, it seems like, in reading this book. Well, how did yeah. that come about? Oklahoma is this really interesting case where, uh, you know, you have a red state that's whose kind of traditional side of their political world is very opposed to uh, legalization of weed. Um, and at the same time, they're this pro-business state who pride themselves on being 
able to make things work for small businesses uh, and not not let uh, too many regulations and taxes get in the way of things. So they're a medical only state. They don't have uh, they don't have recreational legalization, uh, but they have uh, more dispensaries per capita than any other state in America by our calculations. Uh, and ten, something like ten percent of the of the population is has, get, has their medical licenses, and so their uh, their sales are are, are really good uh, by by national standards. Um, it's it's really easy to get a license. One story we like to tell about Oklahoma is that um, you know states when they pass a legislation or a ballot question to legalize weed, uh, there's a, a period of time between when you know the voters express their opinion and, and vote for it or the legislature passes it. And when the first doors are allowed to open, you have to set up some regulations and some um, system for letting that happen legally, uh, stores to get their licenses and so forth. Uh, in Vermont, for example, they passed uh, legalization four years ago and there still hasn't been a single store that's open uh, for recreational sales. Uh what took what's taken Vermont four years and counting to do Oklahoma? It took nine hours. So they they op- they they, they passed the ballot question one night, and the next morning the first weed stores were open. Uh, this wasn't recreational again. This was medical. But uh, just it's it's very interesting. It's kind of a, a surprising juxtaposition of this kind of you know once we okay we we had our reservations. This is a toxic drug and so forth. And then once we but once we uh, we pass it. Let's make it easy for businesses and let's make money on this and let's let's collect some tax dollars on it. And that's going to be a big question I have later, but you it just started another question going in my mind. Do those retailers in Oklahoma make more money on average than the rest of the country by doing just medical? There's we don't a big know challenge that. there. Yeah. You know, when there's a when there's a uh, a store in every corner, uh each and so there's a bunch of states, in fact, uh, Oklahoma is one of them, where people in the business complain, oh, you've provided too many licenses. Why don't you keep it restricted? That hasn't been, there are other places, California is an example, where I, I think pretty much everybody says the local jurisdictions have been so restrictive uh, for, again, classic political reasons that the the two or three dispensaries they allow open in in a town make a bundle of money. Uh, they're very close to the local politicians in one form. I'm I'm not claiming corruption. I understood, yeah. But you know, the, and and they very much lobby saying, "Gee, we don't need any more dispensaries in this town. I think we're doing just fine." And you can understand why, right? And let's get That's to also the where illegal weed flourishes. I should say. Because that, with limited supply. Yeah, that's yeah. Good, and high prices. Yep. Right. Um, so at the heart of the book is that the, the cost differential to the consumer of legal versus illegal wheat today and without significant differentiation in product makes it difficult for the former to compete with the latter successfully. What, what do you think is the size of the legal versus illegal weed markets today, either in absolute dollars or in relative terms, how, how much bigger is the illegal versus the legal? We haven't done uh, much on trying to assess that nationally. We've we've spent a lot of time thinking about California and looking at some data from there. Obviously, the, it's a tough question because of the lack of data from the illegal side. But in, in our estimation in California, three quarters of the weed sold and consumed in California is illegal and only a quarter is legal you know, four years after they passed recreational legalization. Uh, and so that's obviously not optimal. We say in the book, and Can Legal Weed Win, we, uh, we, we say, you know, wh- when voters and, or legislatures have this intent of legalizing, it can't be what they have in mind to have three quarters of the market be illegal several years after legalizing. You know, the idea is to, is to move this stuff into the legal market to collect taxes for the state, you know, spend that money on important stuff like drug education programs, uh, addiction treatment, you know, all the stuff they want to do with that money um, uh, and have more uh, have more of the world's uh, commerce be uh, above board and legal. So that's so that's been a, a, a benchmark that's probably not ideal for the voters who intended to pass legalization or uh, the states that want to 
do it that way. It's it's it it varies a lot by state. Um, we think that there's a, a higher percentage of the le- of legal market in a couple of states that had have had a few more years to to get uh, adjusted to the system. California, uh, Colorado, uh, and Washington have much lower prices. So it's a combination of having lower prices and also having had more time to for operations to get more efficient uh, and and businesses to adjust to the the system how it's set up and also for the system for for. Uh, rule makers to make changes over time that help things run more smoothly. So Colorado and Washington are probably two of the most successful in terms of having a slightly larger share than some other people of legal weed compared to illegal. But there's still a huge illegal market even in those states. There's no, we don't think that there's any state in America where there's not a substantial illegal weed market still that's competing with legal. All right. That's a that's a great answer, knowing, as you said, that you can't exactly know by definition what the illegal market is. And you touch in the book about one additional advantage Colorado has is is tourism. And it's not just uh, tourism for skiing and mountain biking and rafting. It's, it's weed tourism, uh, candidly, um, people that come here just because it's legal and, and might not be where they're at. So to give listeners a little more perspective about your finding – findings, and we've talked about the price differential. On average, uh, how much more does legal weed cost? Again, it's differentiated by state, but and if California is your benchmark, what what is the difference? How much more do I pay for legal weed than finding someone else that can provide it under the table? It's it's probably about double. And and that that would apply lots of places, not just California, because of course lower priced legal weed puts some pressure on the illegal weed. They need, you know, they need to keep their customers coming too. And and uh, where it varies a lot as well is by product. So at the upper end products, the fancier products where where the legal stuff is uh, already quite expensive, maybe a brand name, maybe a picture of your famous uh, favorite. Uh, singer on the on the box, um, you that may be only available legally, and you pay a lot for it. Um, th- and some of those products aren't even available in the illegal market. But it, at the sort of bulk market level, uh, there's uh, where the legal prices are at the lower end of legal prices. Illegal prices are a lot lower, and that's partly because you have these taxes and regulations that cost a lot whether you're at the high end of the market or the low. And, and so that really is pen- penalizing the low end of the market, maybe outdoor grown, uh, maybe uh, uh, stuff that's uh, equivalent to street weed, you'd say it that way. Right. And you, you just opened the door to a discussion about how the pricing in one market does actually affect the pricing in the other. This is an audio only podcast series, so I can't put up your supply demand curves and the representation of price elasticity, or in this case, really inelasticity. But has legal weed pricing, has illegal weed pricing gone up due to a pricing umbrella of sorts by legal weed? Or is competition enough that there's no change? Again, I'm asking you to comment on a market about which no one's lining up to uh, give you their, their general ledger and accounts. But uh, what, do you, what do you know? In general, we've seen illegal weed prices be fairly stable and legal weed prices responding a lot to the increased taxes and regulations that come in at various stages of regulation. But Dan may have more to say on that. Yeah, it, uh, John, uh, our economic theory and models and, and common sense tell us, gee, if you can get away with a little higher illegal weed price in, in some high tax state, great, you'll do it. But we really don't have systematic data there. And, you know, you, there is data floating around the web where people say, gee, what did you pay for weed last week? But there's no, no sense that that's random to start with and no sense that people are honest about it to start yeah. with. So we're, we're hesitant to, to publish those sort of numbers because we don't really think they're very systematic. What we've, uh, so, so the price numbers are really hard to get on the illegal side. That's for sure. We, you know, we have our impressions and uh, from markets where we talk to people. But again, that's that's where we get this two to one price sense. OK. But, uh, how and, one thing that we've seen anecdote uh, from anecdotal evidence is that but it's it's not just a couple people saying and there's a sort of widespread anecdotal evidence, let's say that there's some leakage 
between, you know, w- when you have some farms that are producing a lot of legal weed, trying to produce a lot of legal weed, and they don't find the market for it, that there are ways that people are kind of, you know, cutting back corners through the uh, through the system. And basically, some so some weed that's uh, intended to be grown legally ends up uh, on the illegal market. And so that may be increasing supply uh, of illegal weed, which could uh, exert a downward pressure on prices there. And in, in, in the what you what you avoid then is you may have to comply with certain regulations, say at the growing level, but you don't pay the rest. You don't pay the taxes, and you don't pay the rest of the regulations through the uh, marketing system, manufacturing system, Fly all shape. of that stuff. Okay, and I'm going to modify this next question because it, it was about profitability. But if we don't know um, price on the illegal side exactly, but we're certainly not going to know profitability per pound comp- comparable. Let me ask another, my favorite metric for economics and, and viability of a business. Are the legal weed producers um, at least earning their cost of capital? Like they're not getting rich, but are they are they in viable businesses at the current, and again, state by state, but with the current tax and regulatory schemes, are, are they viable? It- uh, let's let's break it into some segments. So we've got the growers because this this is a this is an industry with uh, some vertical integrated firms. We know growers who are also own a retail store, but there's no particular reason that you know a guy with a dairy farm uh, sells ice cream. They could, but that's a different business. And the, and same same as weed. Uh, let me start with the growers. I would say. Um, A third or two, between a third and two thirds of the legal growers are doing okay, they can make it. Probably a third of them right now are saying, what in the hell have I done here? And that's a combination of two kinds. There'll be the craft weed person who says, gee, I've got a little land. I know something about weed. I can do this. They get a license. They don't they, they, they're not allowed to open for a year and a half. So there grows all their capital, just waiting to open, uh, legally, there goes their capital. And now they're struggling and prices go down and, and they're not covering their costs. So now they're not making back that capital. And, you know, six months later, they're out. The other kind of businesses struggled are the ones that have hired the, uh, the Harvard graduate with a Yale law degree, to be their advisor. So there goes a half a million dollars a year. And, 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 you know, we read in the news all the time about this or that company funded by hedge funds that have decided big news over the last six months or dozens and dozens of these companies have struggled and either they've left the business or they cut way back. The news in the last week or so was the biggest Canadian company that has shut down a number of things. They had the biggest and fanciest and most technically sophisticated greenhouses in the world for cannabis. Uh, they're on the market for a, a third or less of what they capital they put into them. So it's not just the little mom and pop guys that have struggled. Some of the big guys have struggled. And whoever hasn't really been ahead of keeping their costs under control and knowing that this is an, you know, knowing it's an, it's an expensive business. Let me say, uh, farming is a tough business, so th- this isn't unique to cannabis, but I think it's worse in cannabis in terms of the, the churn, the turnover. And you, you do mention that, you know, you it is a, an agricultural business, but you, you got to understand business, right? Um, uh, uh, yeah. Let me say, when it comes to almonds or, 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 or avocados, um, the growers that are still there, Remember, there's generations of legal growers of almonds and avocados or alfalfa. Those folks um, who thought they could be in those farming businesses because they knew how to grow the crop are long gone. And the people that technically are sophisticated, uh, my favorite case is a friend of mine here in Yolo County, California, who after he got his engineering degree, got his MBA. He also happened to be a great farmer. And he's now farming with a couple of his kids and went from a few hundred acres to a few thousand acres over uh, that period of time. Got it. Um, do we still believe that legal weed doesn't really offer anything 
special for this price differential other than avoiding legal risk. And I would argue for the newcomers to the market, and I'll ask a question about that later, the promise of safety or, or, or purity or looking at a label and knowing exactly uh, what they're getting. Um, here, let's, I'll jump ahead. Talk about the comparisons, um, similarities and differences to the wine market and possibly the ability to market up a little bit what you have. Sell, you know, sell the concept of a premium product. Yeah. So with, with weed, uh, unlike with wine, um, you have a very low familiarity on the part of new consumers with the product with, with, uh, uh, basically you have legal weed and illegal weed. So in wine, you don't have legal wine and illegal wine. There's not much illegal wine in the market. So, so these are very different in this regard, legal weed and illegal weed. We think of as pretty close substitutes, uh, in the sense that, uh, the packaging may differ a lot. The, uh, although in some cases, illegal producers and by illegal, we just mean unlicensed, uh, you know, you, they're even able to copy or create their own kind of cool packaging. So it's not it's not like the only cool designy fun packaging you can get is le- is uh, legal. You can also get that stuff illegal. When you if in the case of flour, you take the product out of the package, you roll it into a joint and smoke it, or put it in a pipe and smoke it. Uh, there is, so far as we can tell, nobody, uh, not the not the biggest cannabis connoisseur in the world, could can tell the difference from smoking it whether the producer of that nug has a license from the state or not. Uh, so there, there's no difference there, you know, and there's, uh, uh, there are, you know, maybe you could see some patterns in potency differences. Like there, there may be some, you know, uh, uh, pat- uh, differences in average potency or something, but you can grow, you know, you have, you have very high potency stuff from both the legal and illegal markets. You also have lower potency stuff from both markets. So, the product itself, the sensory characteristics, the taste, the smell, the psychological effects, you don't, you don't really have any uh, concrete differences between uh, legal and illegal. Uh, John, as you say, though, there are concrete differences. Where there are concrete differences is in things like safety certifications, testing. So legal weed has a sticker on it saying it's been tested, it's been certified, it's been uh, vetted by some state authorities. Uh, to, to be certified as safe in certain ways, so that may matter to some. That you know that matters to some consumers and not not others. Um, some of the new consumers in the market who are maybe squeamish about trying weed have always heard it. Oh, it's a little dangerous. It's a narcotic. It's an illegal drug. And so now that it's legal, there may be a particular segment of those new consumers who are more reassured and, and care more about those kinds of labeling, safety attributes, and so forth. On the other hand, you have people who have, uh, that's most of the market that are longtime consumers who already were, were buying from someone they knew and trusted and liked the stuff they were getting, knew where to get it at, you know, the right stuff at the right price. And for them, it's kind of a, uh, it's a, it's a hard, uh, you actually have to do a lot as a, as a competitor to say, why would that, why would that person switch? Why would they want to switch to the legal stuff when they, when they're already getting stuff on the, uh, underground market that they've that they like at a fair price. Um, they, those people in particular may not be willing to spend extra for these government stickers. In fact, for some people, that may be even a detractor from the value of the right. product. All right, the antithesis of my philosophy. <laughs> um, you, you know, there are um, there are people we know it, not because of their own legal liability, because most of that's gone away for consumers. In a, in a state where it, it, you know, there's an illegal market, but if if John, if you wanted to sell me weed in California, uh, and you didn't have a license, uh, you'd be doing something illegal, but I wouldn't be. Uh, so, I, but there, but nonetheless, there are people who say I want I would rather support the legal industry. Something bugs me about these guys that are avoiding taxes and aren't playing by the rules. So I'm going to support the legal weed industry. And if I have the money, fine, I can do that. And it's sort of like people that pay extra for their food to buy it from somebody they like, or, or, and you know, many of us go to a farmer's market just because we like the idea of helping out our neighbors who are, who are growing stuff near us. And, and I wouldn't discount that, but 
it's it's not the majority of the market. M- most people don't say, "Gee, I have a bunch of extra money in my pocket. I think I'll pay extra." Right, and it's a big difference if you are a very regular daily user and the quantities that the extra dollar adds up as opposed to someone that just got back into it and is trying it once in a while. And I, I, I can tell you, I was a firefighter for nine years that the, the weed tourism and the safety of legalization and the labeling definitely work together. You know, people, you know, I, I ran many a call on some, uh, a small group of lovely 40 year old women who flew in from Minneapolis for, to try this crazy thing called Mary, marijuana and, um, uh, ate a little bit. It was the edibles that always, always tripped them up, you know, the, because you could get a whole piece and the, they're, they're the labeling's a little tricky, have something 20 minutes later, enough, they try a little more 20, 15 minutes later, they try a little more and then bam, it hits them all at once and they think they're dying and they call 911. Um, <laughs> but they definitely didn't fly in here to, you know, find a, a dealer on the, on the corner. Uh, they came in cause they, literally there was a dispensary across from their hotel and they could do it all at once. Was, that's, uh, a, that's a funny story and an interesting one also because uh, one, of, one of the sets of rules that might make some, some real sense that they have imposed on legal weed is uh, labeling, is, is really careful measuring and labeling of the doses you're getting with edibles and homogeneity. So with hom- this homogeneity requirements, meaning you've got, let's say you've got a, a chocolate bar or, or a batch of brownies, the idea with a, a lot of the legal standards that was not at all being observed in the illegal market or still isn't is that you know every little chunk of that product has to have the same amount of weed uh, compared to any other chunk and it has to be distributed homogeneously and and it has to, and the and the packaging and the labeling has to, has to be really uh, specific and correct about how much would be in any one bite um that's that was actually t- much to the chagrin of a lot of edibles producers who were like no oh, this is you know we're making they're making some of them are making these kinds of edible products where homogeneity isn't naturally you know, blending at all and making it perfectly even in every bite isn't necessarily the way that they wanted to or were making the product. But there is a safety aspect to that. And uh, although that said, it, it still may not compensate for this co- classic problem with edibles that edibles take a long time to kick in. And people who aren't experienced with edibles, you eat a, you eat a few bites and then if you, not another hour, oh, I don't feel anything, you eat a few more bites. And then people get in trouble. I don't think there's anything legal labeling could could do about that problem. No, you're right, and it was uh, it was pretty common. Um, you just brought up uh, this line of reasoning. The edibles market still seems to me, uh, just having read your book, an area for potential differentiation. Because in Colorado, you can walk into a dispensary and see you know edibles or gummies with one milligram of THC and five milligrams of CBDs, two and ten, or five and five. Um, do those products exist at, at, at that level of specification in the, in the unlicensed market? The, we know the product exists in general, but I think you're on to something very important there, John. People that have l- learned they want a particular kind of product, they, they may be, in that case, in one of these categories where there's just no perfect substitute in the illegal market at all. That, that product doesn't exist. That ratio, say, of CBD and THC would not exist. And, and I think it is fair to say that, that as, as Robin said, customers can legitimately expect uh, the, um, the legal weed to meet the specifications. Certainly, there's, it is as regulated as well as anything else you'd eat, you know, uh, and, and in that sense, it um, probably is safer for some cu- customers, particularly new customers. Uh, into cannabis, and and people have a f- have a feel for that. So that is another uh, advantage, not enough of an advantage. You know, we're still talking about three th- three quarters of the consumption illegal. What is unlicensed weed legal enforcement like in states with full recreational weed? As you said, it's not illegal to you to have marijuana on your on, on your person in a state where uh, it's legal. Um, it's the, the risk is to me on the selling side, but what do they do? Do they, I, I just thought of this, I couldn't, I couldn't even guess. Do they, do they lay off? Cause you're like, Ugh, you know, it's legal, you know, or do they go after those producers 
uh, and, and enforcement because essentially they're competition now with the state. I mean, I think the important thing to keep in mind as a background for that question, and it's a good question, is what did the voters have in mind? What did the legislatures have in mind when they legalized? And the number one thing for many in the minds of many voters and many people who wanted weed to be legalized was let's free these people from jail. Let's stop in, uh, imprisoning people and, and, and prosecuting people for using or selling a substance that we think shouldn't uh, be illegal. So uh, the problem is, you know, you, you, you have a lot of people who are, you know, you make an expensive and difficult system to get into. So you have a lot of people who are breaking the rules, some people who are breaking a few little rules, other people who are just doing it completely illegal. And uh, you don't actually want to, to just start throwing people in jail and to increase enforcement dramatically. Uh, on the other hand, you have these these guys who've put all their money, you know, their life savings into getting legal, getting the licenses, hiring the, the lawyers and consultants you needed to get the, li- to get the license, uh, paying all the taxes, following all the regulations. And, uh, and then their, their neighbor down the street is just still selling it, you know, half the price. Uh, and then, so they, you know, they're, they're an instinct of a lot of these folks, um, who may have been kind of activists previously about legalization, they still want to like rat out their neighbor because, you know, it's like, they're, you know, the, the, this, this, this is so unfair. Like I, I, I'm putting in all the effort I'm, I'm making, I'm following all the rules and I can't survive because this guy's selling at half the price. So it's this interesting, weird set of incentives. So, but, but, but I think in the, in our book and, and Dan and I, you know, we think that the, the solution, the, the, the resol- the longer term resolution to that is not increased enforcement. It's, it's decreased barriers to people getting legal. Uh, and that can take, and, and those barriers can take many different forms, whether it's uh, uh, regulations that are just, dif- you know, just make it difficult. In, Cal- in the case of California, one of the biggest problems of all, uh, 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 and, and, and in many cases, these have nothing, this, this has nothing to do with the way the regulators even implement things. It's, it's just the way the ballot question was written uh, initially. It basically gave local jurisdictions, local towns or, or cities or counties, the right to just opt out of the whole system and say, you can't have any legal businesses in our whole county. And that happened all over California. Uh, uh, 70% of local jurisdictions there said, passed total prohibitions after quote unquote legalization. And so, and these were often, these were, these were places that had, where the majority of voters had voted to legalize, but they said, not in my backyard. Uh, uh, And so, and so they made it illegal for people to even open businesses there. You have the business, you therefore have these, these local areas where they're dominated by illegal sellers. Um, And uh, to us, the solution, the longer term solution again, is to uh, relax those kinds of, uh, barriers for to people getting into the industry uh, legally. Let me add just a bit to that, if I could, John. Uh, uh, very directly, we, um, you know, there are uh, substantial businesses, very large businesses in illegal weed, and and I think and and some of them are violating in a in a severe way environmental rules and water pollution using using uh, uh, farm chemicals, pesticides that have been banned in the United States for 50 years, and yet they're finding them in streams where there's a lot of illegal cannabis. And I don't think there's any sympathy uh, for those businesses. You know, there's nobody saying, oh, well, gee, they're nice guys. Let's not, uh, uh, where, where Robin and I emphasize if, if it's, you know, the teenage kid on the corner who's, who's, who's selling uh, uh, joints, uh, Let's not throw him in jail for the next 20 years. Uh, joints are legal and, and he's selling them. He doesn't have a license. Throw him in jail. W- there's where we want to say let's relax things enough that uh, those sort of folks, if they if they're, can be employed in the cannabis business in a legal way, let's, let's allow that to happen. And it's certainly a, a frustration when you want to, you need to monitor and enforce the regulations, but at the same time, if you if the only place you're enforcing regulations is on the legal guys, and you're not doing it against the unlicensed guys altogether, that is a that is an added frustration, and I think lots of people struggle with it. 
Yeah. And Robin, I, just before I go on to the next question, I actually live in such a county in Colorado where we all voted for legalization and a uh, state did it. And then they left it up to the counties. And my town is unincorporated Jefferson County. And the county said, yeah, we're going to, we're going to opt out. No dispensaries in our county. So you drive to Clear Creek County in Idaho Springs, you go down the hill to, to Golden, you know, but, uh, or yeah, delivery we don't. services. You know, the other, in California, delivery is is available in places where there's no dispensaries, and that's probably. But again, you know, that's a expensive and and a weight and all of that stuff. And the legal guy, uh, the guy who knows a guy, you know, that he's the he's the guy you call. So, yeah, I think the the one of the reasons for these disconnects between what voters voted for and what um, and what these local prohibitions end up being is it just comes down to the voters not being uh, represented uh, proportionally by whoever the county supervisors are or the, you know, it's, it's just a different crowd, the people who are running it versus the people who are voting. Uh, but it's, it's, it is interesting and weird that we, you know, you see, this, Oh, I don't want to, I don't want the tax dollars for my local uh, town. Let, let's give all the tax dollars from all this legal weed to, to, to the next town over, let's let them uh, enjoy that tax money and, and make uh, you know infrastructure improvements and, and and beautify their downtown with that money instead of us. It's it's hard to understand. It is, but you, you described I think our county uh, almost exactly the differentiation between the small group of people that run the county and where they are on the continuum versus the average average uh, voter. Let's uh, go back to economics for a second. Um, retail shops, you said, are closing. You already introduced the idea, Dan, of, of invested capital and how some of the biggest ones are the ones that are going under, at least in that one example of Canada. So are there are there limited scale benefits? Is, uh, is this not going to emerge into you know, a few oligopolies or even a monopoly in a state by state? You know, we'll see. Uh, let's let's take a, a ten or twenty year horizon. Let's take a 20, ten or twenty year horizon where we've got at least some form of national legalization, so that you can. And we do have we do have successful businesses that operate in California and Washington State, and are are getting ready to expand in New York, and and so that people have figured these things out. I do think the scale economies. Are the for or for the most part on the business side of somebody's figured these things out how to make the business work and if they're good mm, at it leverage that leverage that more than more than uh, uh, bigger greenhouses yeah yeah b- b- building an automobile plant is an inherently large scale operation uh, uh, I do know from the rest of farming that talent tends to get bigger. So my friend who started with a couple hundred acres and now is several thousand acres, it's because he's just better than everybody else. Uh, People look at that and say, gee, I've got 500 acres. I'll make more money renting to him than I will trying to farm it myself. And I think that sort of thing will happen naturally in cannabis uh, at at the farm level. The retail is interesting. And there what will happen with respect to chain stores versus uh, local operations? And we know there's a tension there between the people like the, the, the local coffee shop, but, you know, that hasn't kept Starbucks from being a national chain or a global chain, et cetera, even though there are plenty of people that say, gee, I'd much rather go to my local roaster and, and, and my local coffee shop. There's some real challenges there where, Everybody in the world knows your brand name. We haven't gotten there yet for cannabis, I think. Yeah, and in between those two levels, you have manufacturing, where you know cartridges, the manufacturing of cartridges, which involves some uh, cannabis inputs, uh, some raw raw inputs, and then also some processing and some materials uh, to put that together. And of course, there's economies of scale there, um, where getting up to a certain size is is helpful. It's not clear whether you, you don't need to necessarily be a mega global corporation to to, to, to manufacture cart- vape cartridges efficiently, but your uh, a little mom and pop place trying to do it is not going to be that competitive on price. 
the the other point I wanted to make on, on this uh, the vertical integration in the marketing side is is what we've seen in the in the in the vegetable business. It took fifty years, but we saw the gradual demise of of local wholesalers, where the restaurants and the grocery stores in a town, you know, would go down to the fruit market in Chicago. Or, or uh, and and those places now exist as sort of historical out- artifacts, and instead you've got uh, shippers out of California or out of Colorado, for that matter, that are shipping melons all over directly to Safeway's warehouse or directly uh, to the retailers, and that's happened to some degree in cannabis, even in the uh, um, uh, medical cannabis, you'll have growers that have relationships with particular retailers, even if they're not they're not an ownership relationship. Uh, there may be a uh, an informal contractual relationship, and more all the time, some sort of longer term contractual r- relationship. I'll grow the stuff, you'll buy my crop. We'll negotiate on price a little later when we see where the price goes, and I see those relationships expanding. And there's a certain amount of scale to that. You know, there's a store that says, wait a second, I don't want to be left out if if good old Fred doesn't deliver this year. I, I, I can't leave my 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 uh, shelves bare. So I want to deal with some group of growers who I can be sure at least one of them is going to be supplying the products I need. So now you have a little bit bigger business not just a single grower, but a group of growers that may go through a marketing service, for example. All right. Robin, you talked already about lowering barriers for licensed wheat producers and, and retailers. So put on your consultant's hat here for a second. I don't want to sound like Arthur Laffer, but is there room for states to lower the cost of legal wheat producers and then increase the licensed weeds share of the market and make more money at the state level at at best and at worst just don't kill the the golden goose like do, do states ask you are they do they understand this um or is it or is it still an uphill battle and obviously again state by state i mean i think without really any good data on the size of the illegal market it's it's really hard to make uh, specific assessments state by state or even more broadly about where on the Laffer curve we are, you know, whether, you know, it's to the point where taxes, you know, once if you, if you, if you uh, end up with a market price that's dub for legal, that's double illegal, it's problematic, you know, would increasing taxes 1% from there uh, increase or decrease state tax revenue? Who knows? Uh, and in most cases, we don't have enough information to make that assessment. But the, it's the thing. The important thing is not. It's not just about taxes. It's a combination of the costs of all of these regulations, and the licensing barriers put together, uh, that that decrease the size of the illegal market. Um, in California, there's they're now considering a, a the possibility of of getting rid of the uh, cultivation tax um, uh, for for three years anyway, um, and. Uh, but possibly that might be counteracted by an, an increase in the, in the uh, excise tax. Um, it, this is all just speculation. This is stuff you read in sure. the media. So, but, you know, uh, decreasing taxes, uh, what, I think whether or not uh, decreasing taxes has this direct impact of increasing state tax revenue, the point is that the, the, the uh, uh, goal of the state and the people that run the state, the good people that run these states, they're actually trying to help their state economies and help people stay in business who, who start small businesses and medium businesses and invest in, in that state as opposed to other states. And so their incentives aren't just to collect the maximum number of tax dollars for the state, but it's also to uh, improve the economic conditions in the state. Keep, Uh, keep people in business. Let me add a little bit to that. Um, The, one of the things states can do if they want to increase tax revenue is to streamline their regulations because the regulations uh, uh, are complicated enough that they actually cost something to, to run those regulatory systems. Plus, they probably do more to discourage illegal weed consumption and sales than the taxes do. Uh, the other thing I'll say is it is it is. Uh, if you think of reducing taxes by 10%, let's say you're in a state where the taxes are 20% uh, 
the the tax I'm talking about, the excise tax is is uh, ends up being twenty percent of the final cost, given all the regulations that you've got. I reduce the tax by fifty percent, and I've owned so so I've I've reduced the tax by fifty percent. Unless sales go up a lot, I'm going to lose revenue. And remember, I've only lowered the price by two or three percent when I do that. And and you have to have in the jargon, you've got to have an incredibly elastic demand. Robins and, and, and really elastic. That is, people have to abandon legal weed in droves for a 10% price drop, say. To swap that loss in... To, to swap revenue. that loss in tax revenue. So that's hard to get. It's possible if you really are in the case where, gee, legal weed and illegal weed are very, very close substitutes. But let's just do the thought experiment. Legal weed's twice as expensive. Now it now it's only eighty five percent more expensive. Do, do you really have everybody shifting in? And so that is the dilemma trying to work with tax rates to try to encourage uh, more legal weed. And it's a, it, it we sort of you you see where the tax authority is coming from. Robin makes a very good point that generating more legal business in general also has improvements to your economy, these so-called ripple or spillover effects for having legal businesses. So I, I, we, we have to be a little careful. And local taxes is a different issue. If my little town of Davis wants to have a 10% tax rate, but the little town of Dixon next door has no tax rate, you know, you can just shut down legal weed in Davis. So, so that may have a, the, these local taxes are a place where I think, um, uh, uh, cities and counties can be fooling themselves in thinking they're going to have a tax bonanza it's if they money. raise their taxes above the level that everybody else has. Right. And to Robin's point, lo- lower regulations and hurdles and let small business people be small business people. And that that's another benefit to the economy. Um, let, let's jump to medical marijuana for, for a few questions. Um, when, when, Way states, some of them went was they started with medical and, and then went recreational. And when it was just medical, you had something called a red card, right? You got from your doctor. Even after then, weed went recreational in those states. And I, I have a very faulty memory on this, but it's, I think the red card helped to avoid taxes, right? It was still because it was considered medical for medical purposes, you avoided some of those taxes. But now with the way it's gone, is, is our red cards even a thing anymore? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a good question, John, and it's a complicated one because basically the, it varies dramatically state to state. So, uh, in, in some States you've had like California, you've basically had a essential dissolution of the medical market when when we adopted recreational legalization they just kind of merged them and they said in california they said if you if you have a, a medical recommendation from a doctor then you can uh then you can get a sales tax exemption that's about eight percent and you save that you can also get if you have a medical card you can also uh, legally buy if you're uh, under 21 so between 18 and 21 there's a there's a group of people who couldn't, who can't go into recreational stores, but who could uh, go in with a medical permission. So there's a certain, uh, in addition to the medical recommendation, you also had to get a county card. I think that cost a hundred bucks. So it's it's something that made sense for really heavy users, people who really smoke, uh, buy a, 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 an enormous amount over the course of the year. That the the eight percent would would would. Uh, more than offset the cost of getting the medical recommendation plus getting the county card, uh, and then and then you open it to a f- that, that that three years between eighteen and twenty one. On the other hand, eighteen to twenty one year olds are are right in the heart of that group that cares a lot about price and is really price sensitive, and so their chances are they're not the ones going into these legal stores anyway. Um, so uh, in in uh, Washington, there was also kind of a I think. Um, uh, more or less, the, the medical uh, mar- market sort of melted away because of the way they set up. In Colorado, as I understand it, there's still a thriving medical market. And also in Massachusetts, uh, where I grew up, um, you still have kind of thriving medical markets and still 
uh, large numbers of people who are still getting their medical cards because the tax savings in those states uh, is substantial compared to what's uh, what the, what you're able to save in California, Washington uh, from medical. And so you you save the excise in California. I think you save the excise tax uh, in addition to the sales tax. And so it might be twenty or thirty percent cheaper to buy with a medical license than without. Um, in Massachusetts, I think it's maybe fifteen percent cheaper. And so again, it's a it's a balancing test of how much you buy per year. You know, it's pretty much everywhere you might spend fifty to a hundred, or even to, in Massachusetts, it's two hundred dollars to get the medical appointment. So it's this kind of calculation. Okay. Um, Dan? And, and Robin raised a good point about how the rules work for getting the medical permission to begin with versus the tax exemption. In, in California, uh, when, when we first started doing this, it was only medical in California. And I, one of my uh, associate research associates at the time, middle-aged guy from Iowa, I said, Bill, would you look into what it takes to get a medical card? I, I don't really know what the rules are. Figure that out for me. He walked into my office 10 minutes later and said, here's my medical card. I said, what do you mean? He said, I went online. I found Dr. Miller. Dr. Miller asked me, what my credit card number was. And because he was a very legal doctor, he asked me my my uh, um, symptoms. I said, my boss is a jerk. He makes me do stupid things. <laughs> that was good enough. And, and Bill, $45 later or 35, I can't remember what it was. There was his card, 10 minutes and 35 minutes. So whereas to get his tax exemption in California, he would have had to go down to the county offices in the next town over uh, wait for 45 minutes for an appointment to hand the clerk there the $100 or whatever it was to get that card that was his county yeah. certification. And get on the get on the uh, state government rolls as a known pot smoker, which isn't, the, yeah, isn't yeah. everyone's oh, favorite right. thing to have to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. yeah well, I, I already disclosed that I was a firefighter for a while, so I was definitely not putting myself on uh, on that list. Um, was and this is outside of your expertise. I appreciate that. But I'm just going to ask questions now about you know business opportunities and staying with the medical side. I, I watched the panel in the fall with Ziva Cooper from UCLA and Sasha Patel of Vanderbilt Medical Schools and researchers in this space. And they were talking a lot about data on uh, treatments for ep epilepsy specifically, seizures generally, stress-induced anxiety, wasting syndrome, PTSD, pain management. And we'll talk about the index funds and all the public companies I, I saw in this space in preparing for this interview. Uh, a lot of them are, you know, listed as listing themselves as biotech companies, so not growing or retailing. Do you see, even if that happens, and if you see anything, you feel free to talk about it. But even if that happens, does that change much? Other than maybe it does, it, maybe it drives people uh, and see who were uh, apprehensive about this to see it as a treatment. But it's still going to the same channel, right? You're not you, doctors aren't going to be issuing it. Pharmaceutical companies aren't going to be involved. Uh, there may be some dosing uh, niches that are created, either with vape pens or, or things like that. But um, what do you when you thought about this, and what do you think about the medical side as a, as an opportunity to grow this this uh, license market? You, you know, I, I it, le, let me jump in it, to the extent that it becomes a very specialized product. Uh, heavily regulated and very specialized in going through, you know, the full medical route. And we know what that takes to get a new drug approved by the FDA, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that, that puts it in a totally different category. Uh, it, it, maybe it shouldn't be, may, may, maybe allowing some cancer patient to, to have a gummy bear, a regular commercial gummy bear is, is the reasonable thing to do. But, you know, we tend to uh, go go pretty far down the line when anything you call something a medicine, particularly if it's pres a prescription sort of a dosage for somebody. But that will be a very small quantity, probably lots of revenue, probably, you know, incredibly high prices uh, because of all this regulatory stuff on the medical side. Um, there is a market. Uh, I would say the biggest issue, John, is that the image of the industry could change you know, if Aunt Sally is going down to the normal cannabis store to buy a package of gummy bears because 
her doctor really does say, not just the rumor mill says, but her doctor really does say there's blind tests that show that this is good for your nausea. It, it'll change the, the, the sense of the industry. The, and, and that may have a bigger effect than anything else in terms of commercial add, effect. I, 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 would, I would just add to that uh, that one of the things that I think is threatening to pharmaceuticals about weed as a category is, is the breadth of things that it's indicated for, at least in the informal literature that's not the FDA approved, you know, medical literature. But, you know, anecdotally, and, and I think not just anecdotally, I think in, in, in the view of a lot of practitioners who've spent their careers working on this, um, it's it can it can work as a painkiller. It can uh, be an appetite stimulant. It can be anti nausea. There's a lot of things that are well documented and well known about its uh, therapeutic uh, benefits. There are other aspects of it that are less well researched or understood. But the I think the you know the idea that it could be and it's not patent. You know, there's no patent on cannabis. It's uh it's a substance that's been you know around for thousands of years and and can be adopted into many different forms that maybe individually could be patentable in, in some situations. But I think you, you will see, I think you will see pharma, pharmaceutical industry getting more and more interested as they see it as a threat, not just as a sort of little possibility of investing here and there. Um, and I think one of the most interesting aspects of this will be to see how it goes down federally in the U S um, federal legalization you know, uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industry has something to say about everything uh, that happens uh, with respect to f- federal. Uh, I think I think that they're they're more than just a passive observer in that process. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. And and uh, and I think the role that pharmaceutical will have in uh, being participating in that market. For example, we could see a federal legalization of medical uh, weed without a recreational weed. That's one one of the many ways it could t- uh, take shape uh, nationally. And uh, that's, um, uh, so that's, in- so it's interesting to think about that. We, we don't, Dan and I are not in the business of making political predictions or, or trying to predict or understand the political process, but those are, those are some things that I think are interesting to think about. And, and you do, but you do talk about, it's perfect lead into the, the next question. Uh, you, you look out 30 years um, and, and contemplate how this industry including federal decriminalization and or legalization, medical or uh, recre- recreational. I'm particularly interested in the banking angle because that gets a lot of attention as these small entrepreneurs try to run a business but can't open a, a bank account. Just talk a little bit about the, you know, the path you see as a possibility uh, from here to national or, or federal legalization and, and such. Let me leap in and say uh, uh, the way I like to think of it is is let cannabis be kale, you know. Let 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 weed be be walnuts. We don't need big government programs. Uh, I would say the first thing I'd say to this the federal government is we got lots of regulations already at where every state where it's open. Uh, let that go. It's the way it's going to go. Uh, maybe a little standardization, but I'm, I'd am i rather say to the federal government, first do no harm. That is to say, we we really don't need a lot of federal programs. Uh, kale can be grown in Colorado and sold in Oklahoma. Let's do that with cannabis. Let it be grown where it wants to be grown. Let it be sold where it, where it flows to uh, through natural economic forces. And the less the government does, the federal government does, other than just say, sorry, we made a mistake. Uh, Nixon, there are a lot of things Nixon shouldn't have done. This is one of them. So, so let's just uh, whoops and, 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 and let it be treated like any other uh, commodity. Uh, and that does mean um, uh, less sort of formal pharmaceutical stuff. And, and like Robin, I'm, I'm, uh, I won't say suspicious, but I, I am concerned that you'll have people say, oh, gee, well, we'll treat it like a pharmaceutical. And then that means every time you open a dispensary, you got to get FDA approval or something. Right. You know, right. Uh, That's a nightmare. I'm not just concerned. I'm suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the point, I think Dan's great point is that, 
you could actually deschedule this. Uh, you could take it off the list of federally banned narcotics with a one sentence law. You know, you you could do as as little as one sentence. And, and, and that, that might bless us more. That might be the best thing the federal government could possibly do. Just take it off the list of uh, banned narcotics uh, and let the states continue as they are figuring this stuff out, which isn't easy. Right. I call it like a lateral thinking or, or blank piece of paper thinking. You know, if we had never had all this, ignore everything we've done for the last 50 years, what should this look like? And say, well, as if it never went on the schedule, right? And it's, yeah. and it's kale. I like that. Um, analogy um just a couple more robin Some would you don't like kale that's fine <laughs> you know, it's fine you know yeah, that's right i don't know why i got so big to begin with but um um robin do you want to talk at all about your yale law school experience and your the what people should understand about justice and the uh the regulations around drugs well, I think, uh, you know, my experience there was that pretty much everyone I went to law school with was, uh, I, I, I can't think of almost anyone who wasn't uh, in favor of legalization in some form. I mean, it's been, it's, you know, people there have a social justice perspective and it's, and it's all about, you know, people who are unjustly imprisoned. You know, you throw someone in prison, you, you, you take apart, you take kids away from their parents, you destroy families. Like there's, you know, we can all we can all sit around talking about how nice it would be to be able to go to a a store and buy weed legally. Uh, you know, we privilege white people who are like we're not going to get in trouble for it anyway. And then you look at the way that it's had impacts on communities, uh, on 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 minority and poor communities, and the way that it's been used as an excuse for uh, <clears throat> as a as a pretext for arresting people that law enforcement wants to go after anyway for whatever reasons or suspicious of so there's a very social justice angle of it there and i think um and and that's and that's what's kind of and it's interesting because uh i i think you know as having become an economist i then end up with more of a free market angle on this you know you see i've seen through studying cannabis but also through studying other industries like food and wine the way that you can the way that over regulation or over taxation can can actually harm rather than help people. And uh, uh, you look at supply and demand curves and stuff like that. And um, so that's one way in which maybe I've diverged to some extent from uh, some of my old law school classmates who were, who had just more of a pure kind of, or more of a Marxist take on this whole thing. You know, but but I think what still brings us together is this idea that legalization is, is correcting a, a grave social injustice. Um, and I think that they, and what's been really cool about having conversations with people who I don't necessarily agree with everything on politically or economically is like, yeah, if you, if you want to legalize, create, do it in a way that's going to create a viable legal market. If you don't, if you legalize and you don't create a viable legal market, then what's the point? Why bother? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're still, you're, 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 you you could even end up in the situation where you're throwing more people in jail or at least uh, putting more people in the criminal roles than you were before. And that's not what anyone wants. So it's a, it's kind of a cool and interesting issue that I think can bring, people together and think, you know, creatively across party lines uh, or across, you know, ideological lines. Right. And, and a grave social injustice historically. And sadly, if anyone saw the story out of Georgia a few weeks ago with that bus of, uh, of female athletes that goes on to this day, one, one question outside the scope of the book, but a logical progression for me just to get your thoughts, because rewind weed legalization a couple decades and everyone's talking about psychedelics from psilocybin to lsd it's got the medical angle it's decriminalized in denver all the way already excuse me do you do you see uh, foresee any opportunity there or does it come out the same way and and up and then down again or um completely different oakland already legalized psilocybin i think uh i think it's gonna on the way dan what do you think you know that's that's expertise I simply don't have, and and I don't know whether uh, what will happen next. Uh, let me say, uh, typical free market economist, I say, yeah, let it be legal, everything, just everything. But there are exceptions to that, and so I start from everything's legal. What do you start making illegal? But uh, but I live in a state where it's illegal to buy eggs unless I approve somebody approves of the way that 
him has been raised. And puts a stamp on him. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I do want to uh, go back to your legal question. I want to have, a, if you will, a shout out for Clarence Thomas, not the Yale graduate that we often think about when it comes to social justice law. But he's the guy back in the rake case uh, 20, almost 20 years ago, uh, was on the other side from Ginsburg, who was joined with Scalia saying, keep this stuff regulated by the feds. Uh, throw these two old ladies in jail who were you, who were making the tea from the plant that they grew in their own backyard. Then he just, and this, we have a little uh, uh, a box in the book. Uh, just this year, last year, he was the guy that wanted to uh, the Supreme Court to look into the um, the standing Akimbo case, the Colorado case, and the rest of the court said, "No, we don't want to touch it." But it had to do with the banking and the other tax regulations, where he said, "This doesn't make any sense." And I think he does have uh, a perspective on social justice in this context that some of the other justices uh, forget don't have, right. when it comes to this issue. Well said. And before we wrap it up, uh, Robin, if you want to start anything about the book you want to talk about that I forgot to ask, I loved your personal stories and your history of uh, experience. I think I fall somewhere right in the middle of the two of you on the uh, in in both age and, and experience. So I kind of had it caused me to stop and say, when, what happened? When was that? You know, but the 80s were its own decade. That's when I did high school and college. But what, what else do you want readers to know to entice them to read the book? There's so much more that I didn't, I didn't touch on, but go ahead. No, for me, no, you just said it actually, uh, which is, uh, we wrote this in a way to be fun to read. We wanted, we wanted this to be fun and engaging and uh, not just, not just full of facts and data. We, 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 we packed it full of data, but we kind of wanted to tell a story that's like a book you could read in the on the beach in summer and, and have a good time. And so, and, and, and we also wanted to make it really accessible. We don't use jargon. We don't use buzzwords. We try to make it accessible to, to um, college undergraduates who are taking their first economics course, people who've had no economics, but who are just interested in the, in the social issues and, um, and, and, and cannabis industry experts and everyone in between. So that's, that was our goal in writing it. And, and uh, we hope the readers I think you will succeeded. enjoy it. Dan, anything else? Well, I just want to highlight um, um, the subtitle, The Blunt Realities. First of all, Robin had to explain the joke to me. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, that's only partly true. But but the the idea, uh, the word blunt there means that there, there are people that are going to be mad at us because of this book. You know, they're going to say, what do you mean? Uh here I am trying to sell this gold mine, and you've just said maybe, uh, maybe uh, not. it's going to not quite be so golden, uh, or or maybe it's going to take a lot of work to get the gold out of this mine. So there are investors that have hyped this industry in ways they probably now, some of them now regret, but there are still people, we think, are trying to oversell certain aspects of it. Uh, and, and that bluntness... Uh, probably has some people saying, uh, wish, wish we'd keep our mouth shut a little bit. But I think almost everybody can benefit from uh, a certain reality in that way. And, and as a securities analyst in my prior life, there's no question I heard people that the extent of their analysis was, oh my gosh, legal weed, bonanza, gold mine. And it didn't open up the proverbial Excel spreadsheet and say, let me, you know what, let me just run this math a little bit and like a venture capitalist you would expect to do, although you shared some stories I have to look up. I wasn't aware of Wall Street's involvement and, and lack of success, but um, that thought this was just going to be the easiest money they ever made. And uh, as the book explains, it brings in a, a dose of reality. And I'll, I'll, I'll tag on to Robin's comment about um, the, the attractiveness of this book as a great read and it's informative and uh, not only bring it to the beach, but I can tell you from experience as a, that nerdy guy that will bring a book to a bar, you know, and sit at the bar and, and read, uh, it's quite the uh, conversation starter. So um, it serves many purposes. And uh, I can't right. thank you enough. Robbins, you have one more? No, bars. I was just going to say bar is my favorite place to read a book. So uh, and and no bullshit. We're no bullshit, like Dan said. So 
And the bar is the ultimate, uh, the bar is like the graveyard of bullshit. You know, everything, everything real comes out of the bar. So, yeah. <laughs> That's well, the truth. I would just, uh, now, now if one of you can say it's, it's great for picking up girls, then, uh, then we got it, you know, or boys for that matter. I don't care. New York Times bestseller. <laughs> I think you would do well in Colorado, which is a very young and growing uh, population for kids out of college that uh, I can, I can say this is p- put down the dating apps and get this book. Okay, and uh, settle go. in at one of our 300 craft breweries and uh, and enjoy it. Robin Goldstein, Daniel Sumner, I can't thank uh, you both enough for taking the time with us today. And, and best of luck with the book. Thank you.